Okay, welcome to part two of lecture two of aerospace propulsion. So here's how we obtain the velocity result, which is the equation in the bottom right of the screen here. Right, if we're doing expansion to zero temperature, that means all the stagnation enthalpy from the combustion chamber ends up getting converted into kinetic energy. And we're assuming that we're dealing with a perfect gas. So starting here on the left, uh, this is the definition of stagnation enthalpy, right? Stagnation enthalpy is enthalpy plus uh, the specific kinetic energy, or one half c squared, if c is the velocity. And for a perfect gas, we can write this in terms of temperatures. Um, so the, to the stagnation temperature is the temperature plus one over two times Cp, where this is the uh, specific heat at constant pressure, times c squared. Now to get rid of Cp, right, the definition of C, one of the gas relationships is that Cp is Cv plus R, the specific gas constant. Uh, and also Cp over Cv is gamma, um, so Cv is Cp over gamma. So manipulating that, Cp can be written, uh, sorry, this is a typo, Cv uh, is Cp over gamma plus R. So combining that back into this definition equation for Cp, um, we can get that, uh, oh sorry, this is, no, sorry, this is okay. Substituting this equation in here, there's no typo. Uh, this equation in here, right there, that's where we get that, so this is fine. Uh, grouping the terms, we can get an expression for Cp in terms of R and gamma. And if we substitute that into our definition of stagnation temperature equation, we get this. Now, noting that in our combustion chamber, the temperature Tc is the stagnation temperature because the velocities are negligible there, we can replace uh, Tt with Tc. And then solving for C squared, we get that C squared is 2R uh, Tc uh, times gamma over gamma minus 1. And if I take that and uh, rewrite it in terms, uh, or just take the square root, sorry, then we get the expression for C that we're after. So we see that we need the gas properties R and gamma in order to analyze uh, the flow in a rocket nozzle. Um, these, essentially, the, what is the gas? The gas is the products of combustion from the combustion chamber. So this can essentially be done with basic chemistry. We can get the mole fractions of the, fro the products from the known fuel and oxidizer compositions and the design uh, chemical reaction, which is not always stoichiometric. Um, and we could then compute the properties of the gas mixture um, from the resulting mole fractions and the molar masses and specific heat ratios of the products. Um, but don't panic. Uh, <laughs> we will not do this in detail in this course. This is not a chemistry course. Um, and I don't want to overemphasize the combustion aspects um, because there are other courses you could take um, for example, uh, internal combustion engines that um, would cover some of this in much more detail. So we'll just always assume that we know our gas properties. So once we know the gas properties, then we need to think about the physics of flow in the rocket nozzle. There's basically effects due to the shape. Um, there's the fact that it's not a clean division between the chemical reactions taking place in the combustion chamber and then unreacting flow downstream, but in fact, chemical reactions take place during the flow through the nozzle. And in reality, there is heat transfer uh, from the flow to the nozzle. Let's focus uh, for today on this, the effects of the nozzle shape specifically its area variation. So this means we're basically dealing with the variable area channel flow of an ideal or a perfect gas. This is um, basically the most, the most basic general modeling approach we can take. And we did this back in, in Aerospace fund Fundamentals. And this is in the, uh, the MIT Open Courseware notes associated with today. This is uh, model two. Later, we'll introduce more complex modeling to capture other full effects in lecture three. So this is essentially channel flow being revisited. So we're going to assume that the mass flow is uniformly distributed across the width of the channel, that the angles of the walls to the axis of the flow are small, um, 
that means essentially that the nozzle is long. Um, the gas properties are constant or nearly so. And uh, that, and this is direct consequence of this, of the second, sorry, of the second uh, point is that the velocity components normal to the axis, or specifically the square of the velocity components normal to the axis is much smaller than the square of the streamwise velocity. This is essentially required for us to be able to consider the flow to be quasi one dimensional. Under these assumptions, conservation of mass is quite simple. Um, it says that the density times the velocity times the area at a given location is the mass flow, and of course, that's a constant. From the conservation of energy, we can get that uh, the you, you, using the same expression we have before here, u is the velocity at a general location, and uh, we can get this relationship between. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. There's a typo here. This should be a plus. CPT plus u squared over two is CPTC plus. And from the assumption of isentropic flow, um, we get a relationship between. Uh, what's happening with the temperature and what's happening with the pressure. So mass, energy, and isentropic flow assumptions um, are what we're going to need to put together the corrected flow equation. And again, this should be familiar from aerospace engineering fundamentals. We'll revisit this later in this course when we talk about um, compressible flows in jet engines, and you'll see a lot more of a formula that's essentially the same thing as this. Um, but basically, we can look at this in terms of a mass flow per unit area, so m dot over a, and this is a function of the combustion chamber pressure, the combustion chamber temperature, the gas properties, and the local Mach number. So basically this is giving the area as a function of Mach number um, because everything else throughout the nozzle is constant. And the value of the area at Mach 1 is what we call A star, and we get the maximum mass flow per unit area at that condition. So let's think a little bit about the behavior of this corrected flow function. So how does the Mach number vary with A, both for the subsonic and Mach less than 1 and supersonic Mach greater than 1 regimes? And what happens to the static pressure as the Mach number varies? So think about these questions for a few minutes and try to come up with uh, an answer or answers for yourself before moving on to the next part of the video.